what the devil means to destroy, to, to bring you down, to, to, to depress you. You have two choices. Some people have fight or flight. And in that situation with my son, we, we fought. We went, no, we're not having this. So it pushed us to the margins and we, 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 we reacted with the name of Jesus. Secondly is, is that we had a situation in school recently and it was just difficult. And I just went, you know what? My prayer life quadrupled because of my present, because I have to rely on him. I have to trust in him more than ever. And I just think, you know what, God, we trust in you. So this morning, if you're going through something, church, <coughs> press in, don't give in, don't push back because the devil, he just throws the gauntlet down and he thinks we're going to back off, but we just need to step up. And there was a, a, a pastor said once, there was a, a boxing ring and he said, listen, there's a spiritual fight going on before for you as an individual, for us as a church, sometimes what we do is we just have to step in the ring because the outcome has already been determined, church. We just have to get in the ring. We just have to have the guts to go, do you know what? If there's a fight, I'm here, I'm ready, and I'm going to fight. I don't feel like I've got the fight in me. The, the other opponent looks bigger and stronger and looks scarier, but actually, do you know what? I just need to get in that ring because the Lord goes before us. Yeah. Look at David and Goliath. David slew Goliath in the oppo opposition. Who, who, who would have thought a little boy of young lad like that you know just with a couple of pebbles could could slay a giant but that's what the lord's given us he's if god's before us who can be against this church so i just encourage you this morning whatever you're going on whether it's sickness whether it's depression whether it's problems whether it's financial the name of jesus is above every name and every problem thanks a lot i just want to uh, share something really quick um uh, when i was when peter was sharing i thought uh, was he sharing his personal or was he, was he sharing my mind because I that's exactly what I wanted to share but uh, he almost said uh, what I wanted to share but uh, one thing I just want to encourage every one of you here um, uh, singing um, about faith is easy um, getting emotional when we are in church is easy but when you get out of this hall continuing that spirit is really really difficult which I have experienced in my life a couple of months ago um, when especially when people uh, out of the church people out of uh, god uh, when they work against god's will uh, even though god has promised something to us uh, when they work against us and want to uh, pull us down uh, it's really really difficult for us to still hold on to the faith um, but i encourage you if you continue to hold on uh, uh, to god continue to trust him and believe him for sure there is a victory i can and uh, i can challenge you that uh, i have experienced myself not uh, long ago very recently uh, with regards to my uh, visa situation uh, visa extension here in this country now i got 3 years extension uh, which i never expected till the till one week before uh, my my current visa expired all glory to god um, uh, many of uh, the church believers prayed for me especially uncle uh, less and uh, pam they uh, prayed for me uh, less said once uh, i never uh, thought that you will leave this country now uh, but at that time when he spoke that I, uh, on that day we were singing the same song i raise a hallelujah and uh, when i was sharing it with him i, I know I, I know in in a week we may go back i never told anybody i, di I didn't even tell my wife no she uh, even she doesn't know because there was nobody who would want me to take uh, into another account uh, otherwise I will have to leave so that's where we were but still I was believing God I didn't uh, share it with anyone but I was still ut uh, uttering words of faith but God did did it so I want to encourage church that never even if if things go in the wrong direction please don't give up don't look at people who, who are around you always look uh, keep your eyes focused on God alone and he will do it thank you
yours is the kingdom yours is the glory yours is the glory forever amen for yours is the kingdom yours is the power yours is the glory forever amen for yours is the kingdom yours is the power yours is the glory forever amen for yours is the kingdom yours is the power yours is the glory forever amen for yours is the kingdom yours is the power is the glory forever amen for yours is the kingdom yours is the power yours is the glory forever amen amen This is not a normal position for me to be in. Um, um, I've been sat at the back struggling with this. Um, the Lord's put on my heart that uh, sometimes that we tend to add things which aren't there. And I'm hoping that we can bring the chorus of that we've been singing there where it says, God has never failed us. And uh, I see there, it says, but you, you have never failed me. And I want to be a bit pedantic here. Uh, I'm not criticizing anyone. But we add an extra word to that. And that extra word that we add to that changes everything you said up there. We add the word yet. Because when we add the word yet, it means that there's still a chance that's going to happen. And if we're here believing that God has never failed me, it's full stop. It's not he's never failed, he hasn't failed me yet, but tomorrow he might do, next week he might do. But today, we can actually say, and I think it reiterates a bit what, what other people have said but God has been faithful and he's not let us down so whether or not when we sing that next time we, we just re-sing what is actually written and admit adding that extra word yet that's just that's just my feeling the Lord has been struggling with that just with me today and I've had to get up and say this and I was just thinking about what Mike said there and just praying in my spirit. And I, I just felt like the Lord wanted to remind us that he always sees things from a completion perspective. He always sees it from it's been done. Yes, and, thank you, you know, Lord. we're walking it out, but he knows exactly how it's going to end, exactly what the victory is going to be. And uh, I think that's what M M Mike was leading into to say that, you know, we stand on the promises of God this morning, mm. that he sings, he sees it his glory when it's all done when it's finished um, we're to celebrate that this morning yeah
Yeah, I just feel to pray for those of you who, when we were singing that song earlier, it said, um, um, he made a way where there was no way. I just feel like some of you are saying, like, almost kind of saying, well, you know, it'd be good for you, but I, you know, I just see no way. And I um, just want to reassure you that God is still in the business of making ways where there is no way, you know, and yeah, and that verse that comes from the Psalms, I lift my eyes up to the heavens. Well, where does my help come from? Like, it comes from you, the maker of heaven and earth. And so, God, I pray for all these people who cannot see a way. God, help us to lift our eyes to you. Help us to see you, not to see the obstacles, not to see the frustration, not to see the things that, that try and hold us down, but to lift our eyes, to trust that you have not finished with us yet, to trust that you still have a plan, that you still move, that you are still in the business of redemption. So God, take our fragile lives, take our situations. God, would you just turn them into the plans that you always had for us? Would you put us on new paths? Would you lift us to, to greater heights and greater depths in you? that we would know what it is to be lost in you, that we would know what it is to be ruined for the things of this world, that we would not just be the same as this world, but go to church on a Sunday, but our hearts would be different, that you would just transform us so much that there are just different desires in us, that there are different dreams in us, and that we are a hopeful people. So God, just put hope running through the core of our hearts, that we would know what it is to long for the things of you and to trust in you do that in as we pray. Amen. This week on the news, we saw people queuing up to get to the top of Everest, a big long queue, and unfortunately eight people died trying to climb that mountain. And the Lord wants to take you to that mountain. They died because they were ill-equipped, and other people had taken the money and didn't care about their safety or whether they had the ability, but the Lord says, I have equipped you. You have the ability. I am going to take you to the top of the mountain. They will come. They will be queuing to get to the top of the mountain. They will come in streams. And there I will meet with them, just as I met with Moses face to face. I will be, th I will, I am on the mountain of transfiguration. I am waiting to meet you and transform your life and let my life just shine through you as it did through Moses, as it did through Jesus, that there is no doubt that you are God. You are a mountain-moving God, and you can do it, you will do it, you are going to do it, and it is already done in Jesus' name. Yeah, so, um, yeah, we are a church that believe that God speaks to anybody, and I'm confident you might have seen that today. And so, um, yeah, we believe that, yeah, the, the priests of all believers, that by his spirit, God can speak things that, that just touch people's hearts. And so you have heard a ton of different voices uh, today, but God has got something to say. And so, yeah, just I would just encourage you, whatever has been said today, if the things that have kind of stirred in you, do whatever it takes to remember those things. Like, if you haven't got a notepad with you, get your phone out and just write them down because we are a forgetful people. Like, I know what it is to think, wow, that is an amazing truth, and then walk away and can't remember it in like 10 minutes' time. So there is no shame in that. There is no, my phone is filled with just kind of random little notes, but uh, God has spoke to me through people, you know, and so don't be afraid to do that because we want to be people who take on board what God says to us and let it change us. And so... Yeah, don't be afraid to do that. So thank you very much, band. Thank you for, for leading us to that place. That was that was great. And we yeah, we appreciate you very much. So thank you. And um, we are now gonna get Caroline up. So just as
God can speak to any of us uh, in a meeting. We believe that God also, God also speaks through preparation. Like, the Holy Spirit is not an excuse to not prepare sermons. Like, that is not, we don't use that, oh, I'll just wing it. I'll just wing it. The Holy, Holy Spirit is not happy with that. Like, I'm confident. He's like, so Caroline has prepped, and she has prepped a lot, and she's prepped well. And, um, but now it is going to be possibly shorter than she'd prep. But she's all right with that because Caroline is a woman who knows what it is to hear God. And so we're looking forward to what she's going to yeah, what she's going to share with us. And so, yeah, I just encourage you to stay open and stay listening to what she's going to bring to us. And so I'm going to pray for you, Caroline, and then, and, and uh, yeah, and, and when you are set up, I know she's whispering, I'm not set up yet. <laughs> and so uh, I'll just feel a little bit more, uh, like I did this morning when everyone was late, and I just kept filling and filling. I could hear the voice of my dad saying, shut up speaking and get off the stage. I was like, but people are still coming in, Dad. And so if you were here, you'd know. Uh, but he's not. He's just watching on video, telling me off. And so um, are we ready now? There we go. I moaned about my family. That'll do. Uh, I'm going to pray and get out of the way. Um, yeah, God, we just thank you so much for Caroline. And God, we just thank you for her obedience. We thank you for our openness to hear you. And God, we just pray that yeah, whatever you've got to say to us, let it stick. God, just let it come alive in our hearts. And just bless her as she just... Yeah, she just gives out as she just shares what you've shared to her. Yeah, pour out on her as much as you pour out on the rest of us, we pray. Amen. All right, that was good, wasn't it? But now my head's really full, so I'm just, um, I'm just weighing and just thinking how, how much of to talk about what we've just had as well. So... Bear with me, because I've got a prepared thing, um, but I kind of feel like you might want to talk a bit about what we've just been hearing, and because I haven't prepared that, that might be a bit jumbled, so I'm just, Dale's already prayed it, I would just really listen to what pops out for you, there may be different things for different people this morning that are particularly key, so um, if I'm a bit jumbled, don't worry about that, God's speaking to us, and he's speaking to you, so <coughs> bear with me. I will, however, mention Lydia, because I was supposed to talk about her this morning, and clearly, I've worn purple. For those of you who know Lydia in the Bible, she was a seller of purple, and my mother-in-law said to me, you've got to wear purple on Sunday, to help reinforce it, so here I am. It was this sort of purple, or a ready purple that she was a seller of. Anyway, Acts 16, guys, if you want to turn to Acts 16, we'll just start with Lydia, um, because there's some stuff there that kind of relates when I can find it. I'm just going to read the passage because then you've have I got time. Yes. I'm going to read the passage because then you've got a, a context for it. So we're reading Acts 16 verse 6 to around verse 15. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Messiah, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus wouldn't allow them to, so they passed by Messiah and went on down to Tro Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man from Macedonia, standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision... We got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. From Troas, we put out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace and the next day on to Neapolis. From there, we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony and a leading city of the district of Macedonia, and we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, who was a worshipper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message, and when she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house, and she persuaded us. Good. So there's loads and loads in every part of the Bible you can pick out tons of stuff when you start actually studying it. And I'm going to miss loads this morning because I just want to focus on the things that um, I felt God was saying 
talking about in particular. So just a bit of background. We obviously don't know much about Lydia from this. Um, I'll just check my slide. I just want to give you a sense of contact context. I think it's three, slide three. Yeah, the one before was good, that one. So this is the, the, the region as it was then. Um, in, uh, in the time that Paul, this is, sorry, I'll back up. This is Paul, missionary journey, second missionary journey, um, and Acts is written by Luke, who's telling us the story of this occasion. And Paul's journey we can track um, from Antioch. You know, he, he spent a bit of time in Jerusalem on a conference, goes from Antioch, and then he's moving along the top there. And the Holy Spirit stops him. So he's in the second Antioch in the middle, and he's trying to get into Asia, if you flip onto the next map, Del, I've, I've put this on from Google because you can see it's Turkey, basically, our, our understanding of Turkey. And so Paul's trying to come over into this western part of Turkey. So if you could flip back. Um, but he can't get down. It says that Holy Spirit stops him, so he's, he's forced to sort of take this route. He's trying to go up into Bithynia then. That doesn't work. Then he tries to go into Messiah. Anyway, he ends up at Troas. So you can see he kind of... The Holy Spirit kind of directs him in this odd pattern. So he can't go where he is planning to go. He's got a plan. He's, he can't go there. Um, and the reason I'm highlighting that is because, as a result, he has this dream in Troas um, of a Macedonian man. So we can see Macedonia on the left, which, again, if you flip the map for me, Dale, is actually Greece. So you can, you can go back. So... Um, he hasn't got Greece on his radar. He hasn't got Macedonia on his radar at all. He's got um, Asia. And the reason that's significant is because he steps into Europe. And the reason that's significant is because Lydia is the first, traditionally, the first European co convert to the faith. So we can thank Lydia. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We're all of us sitting here, we can trace our, our own Christian heritage right back to that which is why it's so powerful, because it's one woman. And it's the way that God will shift just for one person. Um, so, you know, we've got a picture of Lydia. Paul finds her. So he goes to Philippi, which you can see in the top left there. If you flip on to the next slide, Del, I'm just going to take you through these, because I, I just love context and love to, to imagine, you know, like seeing place now, and imagine what it was like then, and get a sense of distance. You know, Paul's traveling a long way. So that little marker at the top there is Philippi. And the next slide, Del. This is um, Philippi now. So this is like um, the ruins of Philippi. I thought you'd like to see that. And um, Next slide. So now you've got um, Philippi at the bottom here. That's the archaeological site. Modern Philippi is over here. So... Paul doesn't go, Paul's practice is to go and look at a synagogue and go and talk to all the um, worshippers there. But when he gets to Philippi, because it's Europe and it's a, a Roman colony, there's no synagogue. There's hardly any Jewish presence. He could have given up, couldn't he? He could have thought, what's the point of coming here? There's, there's no one to talk to. Who do I talk to? So the practice for um, Jews, if they didn't have a synagogue, because you had to have 10 men for a synagogue. If there wasn't 10 men, you didn't have one. They used to go to a place of prayer outside of the city gate where there was some water so they could wash for ritual washing. So Paul sort of thinks, right, let's go and find the place of prayer. So that's what that means. He expected to find a place of prayer. It means that he was, there must be some Jewish people, Jewish worshippers here. And he finds this group of women. So there's the town. And he moves all the way out up to here, which is an, the tradition. It's like seen as a traditional site of Lydia, where Lydia is, he meets up with Lydia. If you next slide, this is a modern um, addition, but this is the spot. I love this. If you go on YouTube, somebody's put a little um, preach on where they've actually been. They're, they're here with a little church. But what's so lovely about this, when I'm looking at that, is you can hear the water. It's the atmosphere, knowing that they were there on this, the bank of this river, waiting on God. And that's what I think God's really, if I said to him, right, Lord, I know we've got to talk about Lydia, but there's a lot in this, you know, there's a lot about Paul, we can talk about everything else. What is it you're saying? To, and he's still saying to us, you know, a few weeks ago, I said to you, I felt that he was saying, Jeremiah 33, 3, 
call to me and I'll answer you and I'll tell you unsearchable things you don't know. Do you remember that? He's still saying to us, guys, we need to listen. I want you to listen to me. And Lydia is a picture of somebody who um, she chose to position herself to listen to God, to go and talk to God, call to him. She's praying, she's talking to God and listening for his solutions. Um, as well, one commentary I read said that the word that they used for Lydia as a God worshipper was that she w- probably wasn't Jewish. She was probably um, a Gentile, you know, non-Jew God worshipper as well. So the reason I'm mentioning that is um, she's in Europe. The what's so special about her is how unlikely it was that she was going to get saved. She's in Europe. She's out of Paul's radar. She's a Gentile worshipper, so she's she's not got the history. She's not even in a sort of traditionally Jewish position or anything like that. I'll just check my list. Okay. Find it. Yeah, but she's here. She is positioning herself. She identifies herself. So the two key things I felt from that was a she's positioning herself by worshiping and making time for God. And two, she's surrounding herself with people who are like-minded. And that, that's a kind of, we need to ask ourselves that. Um, am, I, am I positioning myself to talk to God? You know, he spoke to us about this a few weeks ago. Where am I at now? Have I moved on? Have I grown in this area? And I have to say this morning, some of these stories, it shows, you know, all these guys have stood up there this morning. Is, this is really, God's really moving. And we should be encouraged by that. And if you've felt discouraged or I can't do that, is take courage from the stories that have come this morning. There's people, brave people who are standing up here at the front today who have never stood up before. People who've prayed out loud today who've never really prayed out loud much. And that's us growing. And we should be encouraged by that. that um, and, and if you've not done that yet, be encouraged and to, to be brave with it. He can take the weakest and most significant, insignificant of us. So, you know, we were talking this morning about mountains. And I think for all of us, every single one of us, I am sure, have our own mountains, stuff that we're dealing with a lot of the time. And it can become our whole focus. We All we can see is that thing that's in front of us that is impossible. We're just like, how can I ever get past that? And it like becomes our whole Achilles heel, the the whole weakness, and we focus entirely on our weakness or our lack or the things that we don't have. I made a list of stuff like, you know, maybe you've got no money, maybe you have ill health, maybe you're a single parent, maybe you struggle with your sexuality. There's tons of stuff that we all battle with, and these are our mountains, so to speak. But you know what? God is a God of the impossible, and he wants us to take a position of looking at him and not the mountain, of calling out to him and saying, Lord, call to me and I will answer you and I will tell you unsearchable things. He will give us solutions and strategy for our mountains to come down. And he wants that. Um, you know, when you shared at the end about going up the mountain, I was just reflecting with the Lord about that before you spoke. And For us as a community, I can't say this strong enough, God wants to draw us up out of our muck. So it doesn't necessarily mean that muck's not around. It's he wants to draw us in our spirit up and out of it. So we're not just engaging with our fleshy selves in it. We've still got to walk it. It's the drawing up to him, trusting him, and living above our circumstances, so to speak. Do you know know what I mean? Um, and your, your picture of walking up the mountain really, I felt, was a really... Because it's, it, you could be walking up your own hideous mountain. You're going to master it. You're going to stamp it down from the top. It's going to crumble. It's going to completely... But you'll still step on the heights with the Lord. So there's kind of lots of lovely picture language in there. Because God loves that. He seems to use it a lot. Um, so I'm just going to check and see what I scribbled down during worship. 
yeah, and the in that, so th this is kind of saying the same thing, but he kind of wants us to move us away from looking at our struggles, so that we have a victorious mindset. We might not actually have victory in these circumstances yet, but we need to partner with God in belief that that victory is already ours so that we're walking into it with him. And that's, that's a mindset we have to kind of ask him to help us have. It's not something, and we get that by the word. We read his words, stand on his promises. And I had a few little, um, he sort of flashed up for me a few little reminders of promises. So one of them is Psalm 37. Um, he said this to me, I've got my own mountains, so I'm, you know, every, every one of us do, does, don't we? Um, and his word to me at the moment a lot is from Psalm 37, it says, do not fret, it just leads to evil. So it means don't worry, don't chew over it, don't reflect on it, uh, don't be anxious about it, fretting, because fretting actively up leads you away from God, it leads to evil, it leads to more of that sort of thing, and it doesn't lead you to his godly solutions and his divine solutions um, and it also if you go I, I haven't looked it up now but I know in Psalm 37 it also goes on later to say whatever the enemy has planned against you whatever's coming against you like with you guys Pete and Ruth th the Lord if we trust him he will turn the enemy's weapons back on him so we watch who's watched Wonder Woman <laughs> I love I love Wonder Woman uh, a friend's come to stay with us a lovely a friend's just come to stay with us, a lovely lady we know who's her had her own horrendous battle and she's quite, you know, she's quite beaten down. So we thought we'd watch Wonder Woman last night because she hadn't seen it. And I, I love it because it's such a, I love the, I love her, um, her purity. You know, she's so pure hearted and loving and compassionate, the, the character. I know there's loads of Greek rubbish in it, but if you ignore all that. Um <laughs> No, I'm talking about the modern film. It's really good. <laughs> yes, current Wonder Woman. Yeah, I've forgotten her name, actually, that other lady. So the reason I'm mentioning Wonder Woman, completely dig digressing, is at the end, her title through the film, but she doesn't realise it, is that she's God killer, small g, I have to say, as in idol killer, somebody who's setting themselves up for something uh, like an antichrist type figure. That's how I read it anyway. So... This figure, her, her sort of half-brother, is coming up against her at the end, and he thinks he's going to destroy it, and he uh, unleashes this ma mad lightning attack, and she's like there with her shield, just, you know, like they do in the films. And what I love about it is it all, she just absorbs it all into her wristbands, <laughs> and she just goes, Rah! and he's completely dead, and it's amazing. So it's just, <laughs> it's just the, the, the imagery helps, doesn't it, when you see that, the enemy, he's so convinced that he's got it. He's got it down, and he, he's going to obliterate her. And instead, the complete opposite happens. I just thought, oh, it's just amazing. So anyway, you have to watch it. Maybe you wouldn't like it, but I, I think it's great. If you, you know, if you watch something with spiritual eyes and just say, Lord, what are you saying to me? Even in that, God speaks to us in a film, um, even though it's full of worldly rubbish and stuff like that. Um, what time are we at? Need to draw it up don't we yeah and also now this this is a bit deeper so God wants to draw us up and out and I'm only going to say a little bit about this because I know we're all on the journey here but you know when you get saved you know you know your sins are forgiven and it's amazing and he's done that but God doesn't want us to stop with that and most of us do he wants relationship with us and he wants to purify us because, you know, the, the Bible, does, I haven't got time to show you all this today, but the Bible describes the church, and that's us, we're a part of his church, as the bride of Christ. What did I write in my little note? So, like, if we're the bride of Christ, I know it's a bit weird for you guys, it's easier for us girls to identify that <laughs> idea, but um, if we're the bride of Christ, that's like, we're Jesus' first love. You know, we're his promised one. I mean, you know, when you think about people getting married, there's real beauty and glory and adoration and a complete absorption, isn't there, in a couple when they, they get married. And that's how Jesus is about us, weirdly. And look at us all messy and broken and 
uh, still struggling with sin and bleh, but he's making us fit. So if we don't partner with that, it means it's tougher. It gets much tougher. If we partner with him in our whole life of getting fit, as he's showing and identifying stuff, as we're overcoming our mountain, overcoming our sin, overcoming our temptations, he's purifying us, making us fit. That Every time we overcome one of our mountains, every time we have a trial, have a hideous time, and God brings us through and we think, yes, it strengthens us and makes us pure and strong. And there's some promises in Revelation, and God's had me in this. We had it this morning. We were, we were, some of us were praying this morning, so I'm going to mention it. So in, in Revelation, Revelation's written by th- uh, John, who's one of the apostles, and he's the one that lasts the longest. Most of them die younger. John ends up old, but in prison on an island, Patmos. Um, but while he's in prison on Patmos as an el- old man, he has visions from God about the end. That's what Revelation is. And and part of Revelation, he writes to the churches. But at the end of each of the sections on writing to the churches, there's a little promise. It's If you go home and look at them, you sort of look in Revelation. It's sort of from chapter 2 to oh, sort of around chapter 4, I think. So it's quite tough stuff. Some of it's tough because he's warning. He's warning about certain behaviors in the churches and saying, you know, you need to get this sorted. You need to get these things sorted out. It'd be things like immorality or um, idolatry, stuff like that, that he's pointing out. But at the end of each one, it's, it says something along these lines. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And so God's speaking to us all the time. If we're not listening, we're going to miss it. We're going to miss these significant, important things that we need to do, the work he's called us to. If Paul hadn't been listening, you know, if when he was going through Turkey and he just thought, oh, I must, I, he could have sulked, actually, couldn't he? He could have just gone home. But A, he was in a habit of fasting, praying, and worshipping with his team. So he was listening. He, was, he had a habit of listening. And so because he had a habit of listening, he kind of knew what it looked like to hear God speak to him. So therefore, he knew, because you could read it or I could read it and think, how does he know Holy Spirit said, don't go here? So he was listening, um, and he was obedient to the work God called him to, even though it wasn't what he planned. We could so easily go off on our own tangent here, doing our own thing, and not actually be doing what God's called us to. So we need to have an ear. He who has an ear, call to me and I'll answer you. And then it says, to him who overcomes, I will give the right. And then there's a whole series of promises. So this one, it says, for example, this is the church in Ephesus, but we can claim this for us. I will give him the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So I'd encourage you, we haven't got time to go through them this morning. I'd encourage you to just look them up and have a pray. So I think we're going to draw it to a close there. But I am going to say that if you... Actually, should we just all stand? Let's all stand. Yeah. Just put your hands out for a minute, guys. Just, just focus on the Lord a minute. Holy Spirit. Just let Holy Spirit come. If even after this talking, you're still struggling with that mountain, just look at the Lord. Sometimes we just have to say Jesus over and over again. That's all we can do. Just Jesus, 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 Lord. I am a child of God.
just call to him and ask him. Show him your mountain, but make sure you've got your hand firmly in his. Show it to him. It says in Psalm 1 or 2 that the Lord laughs at what the enemy has planned for us. Yesterday when I was preparing, I saw a picture of someone with very dry and cracked lips. Somebody who's parched. I, I feel there's somebody here this morning who's been really dry and is really thirsty. And actually I'm physically experiencing that right now. So if that's you, I'd love to pray with you afterwards. But Father, I just pray for us all now. As Del said, that was a rich, that was just a rich download you've given us this morning and I pray for each one of us that you'd really help us to focus on the thing, the thing for each of us and I pray Father God that you would seal up in us what you said to us this morning and I pray that you would bring it to mind through the week so that the truths we've heard that you spoke to us about today, that we walk them out, help us to walk them out and walk in them. And that we'll, not, that we'll be different, Lord, from today. We just want to receive all you've got for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Your face.